Welcome to the Rethink Podcast. What are we talking about today? Hebrews. New series. What should we be talking about or what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. What are we allowed to talk about? <laughs> We've been talking politics. Let's move on. <sighs> Hebrews 11. Yeah. First of all, I mean, you know, we're just coming out of the Easter, you know, the Easter <laughs> excitement. You're wanting to bridge the gap back, aren't you? <clears throat> the Easter bunny? No, I wouldn't want to go back there. <laughs> it was a pretty incredible weekend yeah. across both places and at the lake. To watch people, we we had several baptisms that were several baptisms that were planned, you know, but we we had two or three that just and I asked, what's the story? Why today? Why right now? And they were just like, I just have to. We're just I just needed to respond. And they, you know, they come back and they grab some shorts and t-shirt and um, just the Holy Spirit was moving mm-hmm. upon them, and the conviction was intense. And they, you know, like Paul. I, I, talked with Paul quite a bit um been a long journey you know a, a, a wrestling with changes and choices in faith and he said hey, I just got to do it right now wow right now you know um it was just, that was a that was incredible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it was it was really cool and also there were a ton of conversations that people were having with their life group leaders or mm-hmm. other people on staff and so we have we have baptisms for the next three weekends mm-hmm. already kind of planned out you know yeah. um which is which is really what, cool what did how many did we end up having I, we ten? had 10 10 10 total That's pretty awesome. yeah yep it was awesome and nothing against kid baptisms but most of them were adults too yeah, yeah. which is exciting mm-hmm. yep pretty cool great yeah. attendance uh all locations pinkies even on sunrise service, 147 yeah. people for sunrise. Cold, so cool. outdoor. It was freezing. The videos were really cool. Yeah, that was just a really cool scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, was talking to my dad about it, and we were just talking about Easter. And I said, "Yeah, there's 150 people, 148 or whatever. There ended up being at at the sunrise service." And he's like, "Did you go to that?" It's like, "No." <laughs> and he's like, "Did Jeff go?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> and he's like, "So it's too early." <laughs> It was just, it was awesome because mm-hmm. it didn't require one of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it's you know a what life I mean? group, really. Like, like the life yeah, group. Yeah, and like, yeah the, two and, life groups did all of it. Yeah, and it was it was incredible. And it mm-hmm. was just like, this is what the picture of a church should be. Like, you know, I mean. Um, you gotta, you, you got to trust people, right, to, to do what you know they can do. Yep. Just mm-hmm. let them do it. I think sometimes I was going to say we get in the way and like, yeah, yeah, we actually hinder people's Mm -hmm. ability to take steps of, you know, responsibility in their faith and leadership in the faith. And that'll be an Easter that they always remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, it's cool. I think we have to constantly remember like God is the one who equips us and he's the one who empowers us. We just get to be a part of what he's doing Mm -hmm. and help other people discover what he wants to do in their life. But he's the one who does that work and equips them to do it. And so, yeah, sometimes, sometimes we might hold on a little too tight in some areas, but it's really cool whenever we see, you know, people taking those steps of faith and doing it and their entire life group, every like member of their two life groups had a piece that they played and it was awesome. I mean, it, it went really well, and they were pumped about it. So, yep. loved it. And people who didn't come to any of the other services were there. Yeah, new a bunch of new people, mm-hmm. which was which is really cool. Yep. Wow. And probably for for a lot of people, because it wasn't the church doing it. Yeah. It's better. Mm-hmm. Right. It's their neighbors. It's people who live around them. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, just people. <clears throat> so yeah, Pinky's sometimes, campus. Pinky's campus. Is that where we're, we're not. Oh. planning that now yeah. you know there was people that were asking about it <laughs> yeah. so there were the we actually place. did have a few people ask yeah. i knew if we were going to start uh gathering there every sunday mm-hmm. so here's the deal we, we don't have to gather there every Sunday. we're there wherever we are is the church yep, yep. Oh, right. so those live groups yeah. are in that area there that's the church yeah we've made church too much about at, at a certain time in a certain place with certain people certain order yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and it, that most of that's all okay, but that's not it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's not just it. Well, I think you talked about just the idea of releasing some control, and that's hard because we have a a, a certain style or a certain DNA that we we do have to hold to. But you're right; you you do hinder when it's 
no, we have to do it this way, the way I want it done. And But that just proves, like, if we get out of the way and let people do it, because where, where you had hit on was church is often seen as the place where one of us is at teaching, mm-hmm. you know, from, from Christ Church's standpoint. And it's more, it should be more built around where is the word being preached, where are people gathering. And so I love that. I think that's awesome. So we're interchangeable. I got to find a body of water to have the sunrise service in Florida next year. There's a lake there. Is it? Yeah. If it rains hard enough, you can sewers my back out. Wait, it's true. My, is my, it your, I have a little spillway. In I was going to say, maybe it's your lake. <laughs> I do. Oh. I actually, oh, I do have two, I have two ponds at my house. There yeah, you here go. Here we go. Put a lawnmower. Sunrise at Ben's. I won't be there, but I'll. <laughs> sunrise at <laughs> Ben's. Somehow that misses the mark. <laughs> You're close, but still uh, very far away. Huh. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that later. It's good stuff. Anyway, shout out to to particularly to Jason, Sean, Mark, uh, mm-hmm. and and those two live groups. Well yeah. done. Well as done. well as all of the volunteers that made kids stuff happen and yeah. worship stuff happen. Media team, they're here for Thursday night for like nine mm-hmm. hours, and then they're here on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we had we had people show up. Um, Sunday morning and they were just they, they've got this mindset of how can we prepare for people to come and, and be here for the first time and so they sometimes I don't always see things that way because you get in your, your own little bubble and they're like man those those doors really need cleaned off and so it was like I don't know 730 and we got people sweeping some stuff up we got people that are changing toilet paper rolls we got people that are cleaning windows like that mm. it was just really cool so. so one of our um one of our policies here when like somebody's going to become an elder is that they they attend meetings for like a year participate with the eldership for a year before they're even presented um as a candidate you know for approval and one of those is caleb caleb mm-hmm. baker is doing that uh, right now and so caleb went down to the clay county campus a couple of weeks ago yeah and one of his comments was, uh, people didn't know him, yeah, right, which is fine. Uh, that's part of why he went. He didn't know the people either. And he just he went down and he said, but the interesting thing he observed was nobody knew who he was. And he got out of his car and walked into the building and went through the whole process of checking in his kids and all that. And he said every single person that he encountered greeted him, welcomed him, said he was glad that they were, you know. And they had no idea why he was there or who he was or anything like that. Yeah. That's just, again, that's the church being the church. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's cool. Uh, we all play a, such a huge role in, uh, in sharing the gospel. It's good news, and it ought to be something we just engage ourselves in, yeah. uh, in a positive way. And that, that was just, to me, that was like, man, that's cool. That's really cool. Yep. That's what we want to hear. Yep. Good stuff. <laughs> well, we are, uh, we are preparing to go and visit Greece. And so I don't know if the outtakes are watched by folks or if that's going to make the outtakes, but I did a little advertisement there. If you'd like to sponsor us. <laughs> Three easy Or we'll your name on our shirt. We will uh, we'll we'll, the same we'll, Jeff will we'll wrap your business wherever we go. No. Um, we'll put magnets on our minivan. We're excited. We're excited about being able to teach some of that stuff from Acts and we we'll to learn ourselves mm-hmm. first. Yeah. I think that's where it begins. I think I think for me, we talked about this last week, but that's why that's why the Easter story is so powerful is we were able to experience that location. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward I think to the that. The Easter story is powerful because Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but when those two things come together, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I saw Jesus' I empty tomb <laughs> in Israel, that yeah. was... And it was still empty. It was still We can empty. confirm. We can no. confirm. I, I know exactly what you mean, though. I hate all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. When you read the story, after you've seen the place, mm-hmm. yeah. you, you, you just... It's it comes just, alive. It comes yep. alive. And I'm really looking forward to that with the Acts stuff. You know, I we've all been, like, watching a ton of content and... It's exciting to think about getting to be there. Yeah. We're going to go to Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, Delphi, Corinth, Athens. Going to throw in a Mount Olympus and a few other places along the way. But uh, good stuff that I think will, will benefit the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I jokingly say you're, you could promote us, but you really could because it's not in the budget. We just <clears throat> chose to go. Yeah. Well, we got approval. We, we got we, approval. We have nothing to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> we were just told we had to go to Greece, and 
Here we are. Kiss and I'll ask. Ben had to <laughs> yeah. go. To ben Greece. had to go, but the rest of them chose. So, <laughs> so it, it is interesting because the second missionary journey is primarily uh-huh. here in Greece. 16, and, 17, 18 in the book of Acts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it is the, you know, mission to the Gentiles, essentially, and to Europe. It crosses from Asia to Europe here, and it opens up the doors to really the ends of the earth. And so the second journey is uh, very different from the first, but the methods are very much the same as far as what what is preached and how churches are established. And it's really interesting just how uh, the gospel transcends time, culture, and context. All people everywhere. Yeah. And so I'm really excited to see that because we got to see Turkey, which was pretty much the first missionary journey. Paul's second is in Greece. So Good stuff. All right, we're going to start a series through uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. <clears throat> and we're going to stay in chapter 11. If you know that text, you'll know it's just a series of citations for people who chose to live their life, make their decisions based upon their faith. And it really is a series of just, it's illustrations of, of verse 1, really, what faith is. And so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. We're going to. We're going to take quite a bit of time and do each one individually. Some of them have a lot of background to them in their story. Some don't. Uh, in fact, we don't even know who some of the people that are mentioned are mm-hmm. you know, in the latter part of the book. And I think those are the most encouraging ones yep. uh, by the commentary that's added to them. But it begins by, by saying, uh, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Faith, let's, let's back away from that, though, because... This could be an academic exercise Mm -hmm. to talk about faith. Um, It's practical, incredibly practical. Um, This is written, and I'm kind of doing my little context. I think context is huge always. My little context study, like who's reading this? Who's it written to? Why is it being written? Who's writing it? All those questions. And I didn't find a lot of answers. (laughs) Um, Who do you think wrote Hebrews? Any guess? I'm going to go with Paul. Are you? Yep. Paulus. If I had to make a cha- mad to make a decision, I'd say Paul. But I also just read a commentary yesterday that said Paul, so that's what made, that's what makes me think that. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Barnabas. Yeah, it's that's just it's just so different wrong. than some other. Pauls. We know for sure it's <laughs> not <laughs> that. One. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> it's yeah, so the difference is. Earlier, you made a mistake. <laughs> grace. Grace upon grace. <laughs> grace and truth. So what's interesting about the book of Hebrews is it could be any of those three. I don't think it's Paul. So if it it's just not... feels different. If it it's just not Paul, like a different writing the style. style. It, you're right. I yeah. can't speak personally from that because it's Greek. The issues, I guess, are yeah. the Greek. Yeah, and I don't are. have any clue <laughs> right. what that really means. But it's, it's interesting, though, because you guys brought up Apollos and... Um, <laughs> Barnabas, because both of them are disciples of Paul. Yeah, and mm. so uh-huh. whether Paul wrote it or is in influencing, yeah. there's key things. And yeah, the, I don't the, the know. tie. The tie that brings them all three together is their intimate knowledge of, of Judaism. Yes, mm-hmm. whoever the author is has to understand the old story. Yep, yep, and why these lives are lived this way. That could have been any of those three. Mm-hmm. Right, Apollos is in what Acts 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's wise and learned. Mm-hmm. Right, he's the one that Priscilla and Aquila are sent to to uh, further enlighten him about baptism, yep. and, and that story. But he's already, you know, he's a, he's a scholar, right? And then Barnabas is quite the, the the case against Barnabas is that we just don't know what Barnabas did much. Other right, than he's, yeah. a, he's an encourager. Yep. Uh, so we don't have anything to say. That's the way Barnabas speaks or writes. There's yep. no comparative. I chose Barnabas because you chose Paul and Paulus. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though you bring up style and the way that it differs. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I know it's hard to look at style and come to a conclusion about who wrote it. Yeah. But the styles are different. It just feels it feels less cyclical than Paul's typical writings. <clears throat> so, I, but who knows? And it doesn't matter. It has but. the same linear feel that Romans does, though. It does. Where, yeah. where we're basing argument upon argument upon argument. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it doesn't seem to have that feel like Paul yeah. does. Paul's yeah. like, Paul, Paul casts a, one of those big nets that you throw out, and then mm-hmm. you pull the string at the bottom, pulls together, and pull that, and count everybody. Yeah. That's Paul. Hebrews doesn't 
have that as clearly, but I don't know. I, I sometime in the past I wrote in my margin Paul at the top. This. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there it says it right there. Paul didn't write this. My Bible says it. <laughs> it says Hebrews presents Jesus as creator, sustainer, servant, understanding, sacrificial high priest, the great high priest, and the enthroned Lord and King of Kings. Mm -hmm. And, and so the and that's all chapters one through ten, setting him up as special, unique. Yeah. Uh, every role that Jesus plays in our life. I took a class on Hebrews in college, and I found it interesting there. Like in the university, we spent more time talking about who wrote the book hmm. than, than what the book. In the book. And yeah. that's always frustrated me about the book. I know, of right? Hebrews. That's like spending so much time taking prayer requests and not praying. Yeah. It really is, because right. what is written is way more valuable Absolutely. to us than yep. who wrote it. Yep. And just because you're not sure, I mean, any of those could have been right, or they could all be wrong. Right. Yeah. It so doesn't change the that? message. Why did I start with that question? I don't know. You were talking. Important. Sorry about that. I think you wrote in your Bible, clearly every, written by Barnabas. Everybody <laughs> wants to know. Like, that's... Yeah. That's when you hit... Well, it's one of the... Not everybody. Is there any other book yeah, that we don't hey, know? Yeah. Any other book that has no claim of authorship? Um, not that I, I don't think as aware of. No, not as clearly. Not as clearly. I assume. So that's the reason we debate it. Yeah, because we want to. We think we know everything. So you, it's almost as if you have to read this book by faith. Oh, oh I see what you did there. Well, maybe maybe he intentionally, he intentionally hid his identity. Mm. Maybe, huh. Yeah, it's God, and, and God breathed nonetheless. No yeah. matter what, it's inspired. Yeah. Obviously, we believe it's an inspired book. The the audience um, again. The, most of the time, we know who's this written to. This one, we do, but we don't. What do you know about the people who receive this? I already had a conversation with you about it, so I already know where you're headed. Is this well, like then you tell them they haven't had that conversation. Secret knowledge? Well, no, I've it, seen what happens when you answer something wrong. I know. So. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> you get hit by a bus at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> no, you were talking to me yesterday about the uh, chapter 10, verse, I think you said 36. Yeah, 34 to 36. 34 to 36, the context of suffering, people that are struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, we've got our Jewish friend that we oftentimes ask questions of, and I ask him, what, what, what is the name Hebrew? What is a Hebrew? Is that a religious title? Is it a, an ethnic title? Is that, you know, what is that? Because to be a, a Jewish person means so many different things. Hmm. And a Hebrew, which this is Hebrews, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of that broad all-encompassing term of a person that is a descendant of Abraham and so there is that ethnic element of it there is that faith orientation to it it's a person who believes in the God of Abraham mm -hmm. and is a part of as a descendant the the lineage of Abraham so you know hmm. the people of Israel aren't necessarily all of the descendancy of Abraham there are people that are lived there now for instance that you know whatever moved there from other places or whatever in there not a part of that line but uh, Hebrews that so it's somebody who's a part of in in, in biblical times it'd be somebody who's a part of they were Jewish mm -hmm. right and so that that's important but they're Christians that's more important hmm. yeah. so they've accepted Christ as the Messiah um, but we don't know where they're at some people speculate that this is a group of people that originally received this that were in Rome Mm -hmm. uh, Nero's persecution began in 64 AD, and uh, the Jewish Christians would have been at the forefront of that. And so that, you know, those verses that talk about their persecution and their suffering would have definitely applied to them. Some people think that they're from Jerusalem, um, although at this point in time, well, I say that, I'm making an assumption here. I think this is written before 70 AD, which is the fall of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans, because there's no reference to any of that. In here, mm -hmm. we talk about a sacrificial <clears throat> system and comparing and contrasting sacrifices and temples and things of that nature. And it would just seem that the the person writing this, Barnabas, <coughs> would have... <laughs> <laughs> or did I say Apollos? What did I claim? You said Barnabas. Yeah, Barnabas <laughs> would have... <laughs> it's written would have one mentioned of, One that. of them guys. One of those guys. <laughs> yeah. Doubting Thomas. I don't know. It would have mentioned that, but he didn't. So it's probably before that. So between 64 and 70 seems to be the good time slot for Hebrews, although that's not for sure either. Um, so in Rome, probably not Jerusalem, and probably, probably not. Well, it could have been like in Ephesus or around Colossae. Mm -hmm. 
because a lot of the issues are the same there. And if it's a polis, that's that was his yeah place where he was at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and well, Paul too. So um, yeah, but Christians who are so struggling. So all that to say, we really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, what we do know is that they're Christian people who are struggling because they've chosen to follow Christ and they're wavering. Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to basically they're at the question of crisis of belief. Like, do I believe this enough to <laughs> yeah. sacrifice all these things, pay the price that this is going to cost me? Do I believe this or not? So it's people at a crisis of belief. And I think that's an important connection to make because we talk about living in faith in response to the crisis of belief. Because now all of a sudden we bridge the gap to our culture. Benny, you borrowing Jeff's sermon? Yeah, I'm going to use that. <laughs> Once you yeah, read good, it in the Bible, it's, no it's yours. Quote Ben Farley. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think so. At the beginning, when um, Apollos writes, and uh, <laughs> whoever writes in verse one, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That statement is isn't, and actually the language that's used there isn't a uh, religious statement. It's more of a it's more of a fact that. Um, that faith is a part of everyone's life. So it, if you go back to the Greek language, again, I'm reading from somebody's commentary, not my own study of it, but um, but that's what they've said, that the, the word faith in that uh, original language in this section isn't one that would speak to faith in God, but simply just that faith exists in everyone. And Every, so he's, everybody has faith in yeah, something. Yeah, in something. I mean, you mm -hmm. think about, this morning, um, I drove here and I had faith that my brakes would work. I didn't check them. I didn't, you know, it's just, I'm not seeing the mechanism of it. I'm just having faith that it works. So I, it's just this reality statement that's put out that faith is a part of everybody's life, regardless of if that's in Christ or what it's in. Everybody experiences that. So to reject God is a statement of faith. Right. Yep. Yeah. And we're going to get to that as we go through this. But. Mm -hmm. So it's good stuff because I, I think every every one of us, or everyone who pays attention to us, would because we, we've we've had moments in life where we encounter crisis of belief. Yep. Now I think as we choose to live by faith in those, as they come in the future, we're more prepped to respond in faith. You know, so as we respond in faith, it builds our faith, and we respond easier. In yeah. faith in the future, but what what would be crisis of belief? I mean, there, there's a whole host of them that people deal with. Um, I was thinking about how like I've never not had faith. Do you know what I mean? Like I've grown up in church my whole life, mm -hmm. thanks, and so Bob. thanks, Bob. Yeah, I mean, so you talk about the crisis of belief. Like I've always believed, and. We were talking about in our, our life group last night, actually, about about suffering. And I was thinking, man, I don't know if I've ever really suffered either. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like... But even in your struggle, you never blamed God. I don't I don't really think I have. So, let me throw Some this people out do there. That. Yeah. <clears throat> because yeah. I would say we're all uh, unbelievers at times. Hmm. Because every time we choose to sin there is something we're not believing that's true about God. Mm -hmm. And so we're believing he's not good enough, that he can't really satisfy us, that he can't uh, deliver on his promise, and yeah. so we take it into our own hands. Or, or that what he said was best isn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think at times, even though we believe, right, yeah. big picture, we believe God is the one who created the world, he's the one who saves us, we have moments of unbelief yeah. that we wrestle with daily. Yep. And it's it's this choice of like, are we going to go all in with faith, yeah. and let him sanctify us, and let us let him and his word teach us that he is the best in every situation. Yeah. I see it a lot in suffering. A lot of people deal with certain traumatic experiences or or whatever it is, and that's when they start to have that like, well, I thought God was good, and if God was good, then this shouldn't shouldn't happen. I'm. And here in about an hour and a half, I'm going to uh, Louisville and uh, to mm -hmm. talk to their junior high students. And, and there was a, a tragedy mm -hmm. that happened in the school um, this past weekend. And you know, I've already heard stories of some kids asking those questions like, 
if God is good, then why did this happen? And so, you know, I think, I think those are pretty common, um, when it, when it comes close to home, mm-hmm. then I so think those questions is. start to ramp up. What does good mean? And is that really God? Right. Yeah. yeah it's a yeah. crisis. Yep. We'll pray for you this morning. That's a big deal. Yeah. Tragedy. So I, I think that, well, you, you alluded to something though, that's really important, Andrew. It, it is our tendency to look at these people and these stories like we're going to unpack in the next several weeks and think that's good. That's nice. That's not my life, Mm -hmm. right? That's not how things are for me. And one of the beauties is we unpack at least the stories that we, we have some background on. We'll see that, Hey, they're not perfect people to live by faith. Doesn't mean to live in perfection, Mm -hmm. right? They're sinners. They fall. They, um, they, they respond to their doubt. They give in in their crisis at times, but the, the broad, direction of their life or the critical moment that's highlighted in these stories Mm -hmm. they are choosing to put their trust in god who is unseen which is the essence of what he's talking about things that are unseen things that you can't here he is Mm -hmm. right it's a belief that you have yep and so they don't they're 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 great examples for us and i think as we study them we're going to see that they're they're people like us right they're in a different era obviously than ours but they had to make the same choices that we do yeah so back in our um uh, proverb series we had laid out that that proverbs were principles and not promises and i think when we approach the issue of faith um the the evangelical church especially american has started to twist twist not necessarily faith but twist the result of faith mm-hmm. and so i think it's important for us to to understand as we go through hebrews 11 that these are kind of describing the events that took place in these men and women's lives but it doesn't mean if i have faith then i'm going to be like enoch and never experience death or i'm going it, to it's really saying that that's that's not necessarily the important point of of these recounting of these events the point is is that in the moments of crisis of belief, they chose to believe, and as a result, God worked in their life. And so it doesn't mean that this is how God is going to work in that, but the promise is that regardless of what happens, faith in Christ and trusting in Him is ultimately going to lead to life. That is the promise that is on display. doesn't mean the events are always going to be what happens in, this, in these stories. I think that subtle nuance is really important, though. It's not just an intellectual assent. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you ask most people yeah. to define faith, it's a belief. Mm-hmm. It's more than that, mm-hmm. right? It's a response to belief. Yeah, yeah. And so there's action that happens as a result of what they've come to agree upon in their own mind that yeah. God is God, yeah. that He is good, that His way is best, uh, or you know whatever. And so it's it's not just yeah, I believe, but because I believe, this is the way I'm going to choose to be. And that, that's where, that's why it's, you can believe and choose to walk out of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, outside of, of obedience. Uh, yeah. And sometimes I mean, they do. Satan, yeah. Satan believes in God. He believes in Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Jesus and the demons believe and they shudder. <laughs> yeah. You know, it doesn't mean they obey him though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, so. they will one day. I mean, ultimately, ultimately yeah. like crushed. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to do, uh, well, you're going to do too, Ben. Uh, we've done first one through three. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything we want to highlight particularly there? I, I noted I wasn't really, I don't know, I've never really studied these as individual units. Um, it's obvious, like, you've got verse four, it's the story of, of Abel. So we'll talk about Abel. But when I was doing one through three, I, I was looking at it as an introduction, but I actually think verse three is illustration point number one. So what is what is faith? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's what the ancients were commended for. So the ancients are the people past. And so we're going to get a listing of who the ancients are, yeah. right? And the first one is an unnamed person but anyone who would follow what verse 3 says by faith we understand that 
Uh, the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is or was visible. So by faith, there is an acceptance of that this is God's world. And that's his beginning point, mm -hmm. that God's the creator. By faith, we accept that. Because we can't prove it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but by faith, you have to accept the evolution because you can't prove that either. <laughs> yeah, as you say, it takes faith no matter what route you go that one. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. there's, there's more evidence for you know intelligent design. Even if you don't want to acknowledge God, you know, intelligent design has way more evidence on that. Yep. Yeah. It's an easier answer for me to accept that a, a designer created than a choice or a chance happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I... I been dabbling this morning in the con the concept I was reminded of uh, irreducible complexity mm -hmm. um, it's a neat word to study neat idea to study Michael Behe in 1993 wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box and he unpacks this idea of irreducible complexity and creation so that that's you know a testament to God and I, I'm gonna play with that a little bit with the sermon uh, I think I need to find a mousetrap because that's his illustration a mousetrap has one of those old slapper, mm -hmm. uh, right? My fear is that I'll, <laughs> I'll snap myself. Nah, but, pull Jordan up there. Yeah, use <laughs> Jordan. Let him as hold it. He can hold it for you. Oh, see how much you take. To, yeah. So his, his point. <laughs> his point is that there are five. They're like five pieces to a, an old wood spring-loaded mousetrap, and it doesn't work without them. What's funny about these kind of concepts is that there are a lot of people with faith in evolution. And so when I type in irreducible complexity, I read articles on both sides, like hmm. those that think this is, and they spend all their effort. So this one guy goes through the whole process of, well, the mousetrap doesn't need five parts. It can work with four or three or two or one. And he, he ends up with saying that this spring could have just fallen on a mouse and trapped it somehow. And, and he, you know, so he works backwards, like the mousetrap could work this way, this way, this way. And I thought... But each and every one of those steps is, number one, making it less complicated, which is the opposite of what creation is complicated. Our systems are incredibly complicated from what it takes to move a bacteria around or what it takes for our eye to function or our circulatory system to work or blood to clot when we have a cut. All those things are complex. Mm -hmm. And if you reduce them in complexity, that's not what evolution is talking about. Evolution is talking about things that are simple becoming complex that's not how it happens biologically it just mm -hmm. doesn't work in our world that way yeah. uh, every time there's a mutation it's a degradation of the system but anyway that's, I'm getting really sidetracked because I love this subject but the, the, the mousetrap if you take a so it works but that's not the point is this had to be complex and this is what it is and so how did it get to that the system itself can't survive unless it all works you know, if we can't see, we can't see. And there's 26 pieces in our eye that have to work hmm. in conjunction with each other at the same moment, or you can't see. You can't, like, kind of see, or you just can't see. And so all those systems, and that's in this. I've, I've made the, that's not a leap to me. I've made the step of belief that there's a creator. That's what the ancients, he says, believed, that there's a creator that all of the things that exist came from the designer designing yeah. them. Yeah. And that's, that's faith. Because yeah, I, can't, I can't ultimately go back and prove that either. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and then again, when you're talking about this intelligent design, the Word tells us that there is something in our hearts that recognizes mm -hmm. that a God has created this. And, and so then the rest of the Word is explaining, hey, here's who that God is, and here's what He's done. So... Yeah, I, I think everybody has to live, everybody does live by faith, one in one regard or another. And for us as believers, we understand that there has been something put inside of us that recognizes that there is a creator, especially when you come face to face with the complexity of creation, I mean, down to the minute details. You, you just, I don't see how you can logically come to the conclusion that this all happened by chance. Yeah. So if you come to those crises of belief and you don't accept beginning at point A that there's a creator, yeah. now your crisis is blown wide open yep. because there's no answer point to it. Yep. If there's not a divine being outside of self or the systems, 
what do we have to turn to? Yeah. You know, and so these folks that are struggling and being persecuted and are going to have to, he, he tells them, you're going to have to make choices in the future yep. about like, are you going to surrender your property and be okay with that because you know you've got something substantive that's better? That's an overwhelming crisis if you don't have a designing creator. Well, I mean, is is it judges where every once in a while they'll say that, that everyone did what was right in mm -hmm. their own minds? Mm -hmm. well, that's where you go. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you don't come to the logical conclusion that there is a creator who therefore, since he has created, he is the one who lays out the best way to live, um, you're left to your own devices and whew, left uh, we're seeing that all over our yeah, society. Left now. alone, all systems <clears throat> degrade. I mean, without outside input, they don't improve. They they get worse, right? Yep. Be it whatever you have. If you don't if you don't intervene and put oil in your car and fuel it up, you're gonna run out of gas. You're gonna you know gonna burn up the engine. Jordan, you, take note. You've got to step in and intervene, or the system degrades. Yep. Everything is that way. So without a directive from God, you don't you don't improve. I don't know, that man, there's a. I love it. It's good stuff. You walk by faith. Ultimately, it takes faith to say that, nah, this just all happened. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a big leap. It's a big leap. That's a big leap. That guy that wrote the story about the mousetrap didn't need this, didn't need that. He said, if I tweaked this little part and bent it over here and did it in just such and such a way, and the whole re time I'm reading his article, I'm thinking, well, that's an intelligent modification. Yeah, you're still intervening. <laughs> there, there is a being intervening in the system. Yeah, to go along with his with his thought process, then that spring should just over time naturally By bend itself. itself to function the way that it should. Right. But the spring doesn't know it needs to catch a mouse. Interesting. It takes a being outside of that to design it for that purpose. Yep. And that's, that's where people don't want to deal with God because we don't want to be shaped for the purpose he created us for. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't ultimately think logically without removing some elements like that and come to the conclusion that there is no creator. You you have to intentionally or ignorantly remove pieces of that process in order to come to that conclusion. So yeah, I think it takes way more faith to be somebody who doesn't believe in God than, than somebody who does. But to believe in God means <laughs> more than an intellectual assent. Yep. 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 It's yeah. a life alteration and there's yep. the problem. Yep. We don't like change. It's gonna be a good series. Um, who's got the? Who's up for Abel? Who's doing Abel? You doing I'm Abel? I'm doing Abel. Yeah. Are you doing Abel too? I don't think so. I think Van Heining. Van Heining. I think's doing that. Yeah, we're gonna take turns and work our way through this, and I, th I think it's gonna be a, it's gonna be real practical stuff. Folks like us making choices of faith. So, hey, thanks for joining us on the Rethink Podcast. We'll see you next week.